भद्रम करने भी श्रीनुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्ये माक्ष स्थिरंगये तुष्टवागम सस्तनु भी व्यशेम देवहित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्ववेदा स्वस्ति नस्ताक्षो अरिष्ट स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दू ओ शाति 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 The Mandukya Upanishad consists of two kinds of inquiries. The first inquiry is an inquiry into the self, into yourself. And the second one is an inquiry into Om. The second inquiry is meant as a support to the first one. The second inquiry is made as a support to the first one. The first inquiry proceeds in this way. We were told that when you look at yourself, you will find four aspects of the self. The first aspect is the is found in the waking state where you and the entire universe that you experience in the waking state are manifestations of one consciousness, are, are experienced in one consciousness. In the dream, the same one consciousness appears to you as you the dreamer and your dream universe. And in deep sleep, it's the same consciousness which is now experienced as blankness. So these three pairs, um, the knower and the known, waker and the waker's universe, dreamer and the dreamer's universe, the deep sleeper and the deep sleeper's universe means a merged universe. All of them are actually one consciousness appearing in these ways. That one consciousness constitutes the fourth aspect of the self. So the first three aspects of the self are the um, waker, dreamer, deep sleeper. And the fourth one is the pure consciousness, the real you. This, was, this constituted the first inquiry, inquiry into the self. And it reached its, uh, reached its climax in um, the seventh mantra of the Upanishad, where the fourth aspect of the self, called the Turiya, literally the fourth, Turiya means the fourth, that was pointed out with a very remarkable text, the seventh mantra of this Upanishad. Um, now, after that, the second inquiry was introduced, an inquiry into the very sacred sound, a very sacred uh, word Om. This Om has been, this inquiry into Om has been put forward as a meditation, a practice, a practice to support the self-inquiry. We might say, what do you mean support? Why a support? The inquiry into the self is supposed to reveal, like all inquiry, inquiry is supposed to reveal the truth. So inquiry into the self is supposed to reveal the truth about ourselves. The truth about ourselves is that we are this one immortal consciousness experienced in these three states, waking, dreaming and deep sleep. Um, so the purpose would be to shift our awareness of what am I from our present, um, from our present idea or feeling that I am the waking self. This waking person, I am this person. That's what we normally think about ourselves. What the Upanishad is teaching us is, you are not this or you are not just this. You are something much vaster, that one consciousness appearing as this and much else besides. So the shifting of the reference of the I, I means me, what does it refer to? Does it refer to only this particular body and mind in a waking state or what does it refer to? That shifting of the I from the um, waking personality to the pure consciousness, the fourth aspect of the self. This is the purpose of the whole inquiry. What is, after all, why are we doing this? To know the truth about ourselves. 
and knowing the truth about ourselves should lead to the result, the promised result of all Vedanta. It should take us beyond suffering, uh, attainment of lasting peace. So this one, it's possible not only just by understanding. If you do the self-inquiry seriously, if you just give one gives a little bit of thought to it, one can understand, one can come to a kind of understanding. But this understanding is not the same as as what one might call realizing. The understanding and the realizing, remember, they are not two different things. They are, let us say, the, rea the understanding should deepen into realization. The understanding should deepen into realization. It should become a living reality for me. For that purpose, this Om meditation is uh, very useful. It gives you a support, gives the mind a support to hold on to. How did this proceed? That's what we saw last time. That um, the, the word Om has four letters. And interestingly, the self has four aspects. In Sanskrit, Chatush Padatma and Om Chatush Matra uh, Omkara. Four letters and uh, actually not four letters, three letters and silence after the four and third letter. So what are the constituents of Om? The idea is this Omkara Omkara means the word Om. Analysis of the Om will give us a support for meditating on the real self. How does this support work? Because Om has four, four letters, three letters and silence, and the self was revealed as having four aspects, now we can match them. How did we match them? Remember the four letters of Om were revealed as A, U, M, and silence. And because A and U together make the O. So we pronounce it Om because of that. And now the Upanishad taught us that you can map them. The A can be related to the waker and the waker's universe. You think of yourself as you are now, you and your entire experienced universe, uh, associate it with the sound A. Uh. It's a technique. It's a technique for meditation, a, a kind of um, uh, some way of the mind to think about what was taught in the Upanishad. So think of the, your entire experienced universe and yourself as a, just name it a. Then think of your, you in the dream state, not only dream state, the entire subtle universe by which, what do I mean by subtle universe? Mind. Inside, what you feel inside, thoughts, emotions, ideas, memory, your internal perceptions, all of it, feelings, all of it. Think of it as ooh. You, the consciousness associated with that subtle body, which is most evident in dreams. So you, as the dreamer, and your entire dream world, and not only dream world, your entire subtle world, inner world, as ooh. Just call it U, that U which is in, uh, in, the, in the Om. And then finally the deep sleep experience, where all of the world, the universe, is sort of merged in deep sleep, in, in the blankness. The differences are not obvious. Just like this room, if there was no light here, all this would be here, but it would not be experienced. It would just be blank, dark. In the same way, the universe merged in the darkness of deep sleep. Um, call it Mm. what we experience in our deep sleep and what the physical universe would be in that state of cosmic dissolution when at the end of a cycle of creation and existence finally the universe you know the cyclical theory of the universe it is created it evolves it exists and ultimately it's destroyed only to go through that cycle again when it's destroyed destroyed in the sense back into its causal state so that is that silence, uh, that is the mm. Associate that with the mm. And then finally, as Om fades away into silence, associate the silence with pure consciousness, the Turiyam, pure consciousness. And as you chant Om, keep these associations in mind. Um, then the, as the Om, you cycle through the Om in your mind or in a low chant, bring up your entire waking experience fleetingly, swipe it away, 
let it fade away into your dream experience and then again into your deep sleep experience. Could yeah, someone let him sit. As you keep on doing this, the background consciousness should become evident. It should be, you should, one should get a clarity about it, that it is all happening, it's a play of one unchanging consciousness. Um, also note that the waking world is, see, is taken as the physical or the gross world. The dreaming world is taken as the subtle world. Deep sleep is taken as a causal state, not casual, causal state. It's, not, it's, not, it's just the opposite of casual. <laughs> in uh, one Swami taught in, uh, there in Uttarakhand, he said, uh, translate, Ye jagrat swapna to halki fulki avastha hai, sushupti gambhir avastha hai. He said, this waking and dreaming are, are inconsequential, superficial states. The really serious state is deep sleep. <laughs> We think about it as just the opposite. The deep sleep doesn't matter. This is what matters. So, the waking world is seen as physical, the dream world as subtle, and the deep sleep world as causal. And what is... So, waking and dreaming are effects. And deep sleep is seen as the cause. Cause and effect in what sense? In a sense, think about it this way. Suppose there's a lump of clay. And then it is made into lots of pots. It's an example from the Upanishads. Lots of pots of different shapes and sizes. But suppose the pots um, do not take shape and the potter again sort of lumps all the clay back into a wet, one wet mass of clay. Now what happened to all those wonderful variety of shapes and sizes? Pots and jars and you know, big pots, little pots, fat pots, skinny pots and all of that kind of pots. It's all back into one mass. In that sense, that lump of clay is the material cause of all of those pots. In that sense, all of those, those pots are still there in that lump of clay. The shapes have disappeared, but they all emerge from that. The substance is still the same. In that sense, can we not call that lump of clay the material cause? In Sanskrit, upadana, material cause. The substance out of which everything was shaped. Now think of your deep sleep as the material cause of your waking and dream worlds. Because all the differences that we appreciate here are still there in deep sleep. Just we don't cognize the differences. It's like pulling a shroud over your face and not seeing the variety. The variety is still there. So the deep sleep is regarded as a material for a material cause of the other two. Anyway, the point is um, gross state, causal state, uh, gross state, subtle state, causal state. What about pure consciousness? It is neither cause nor effect. In Sanskrit, karya karana vilakshana atma. It's something that is distinct from cause and effect. It's not the cause of anything, nor is it the effect of anything. In the cosmic level, it is God or Ishvara who is the cause of the universe. So from God alone, from the power of Maya, that is the cosmology, entire universe is projected, sustained by God and withdrawn back into God. What is the relationship of that God to the sturium we are speaking about? That God is none other than the sturium, but the sturium, the pure consciousness, the God, that God is a cause of the universe. The sturium is not, not even a cause of the universe. It's like, once again, I'll give another example. It's like the rope is a cause of the snake. You say, come, come. The, uh, the rope which is mistaken for a snake, you can see that what is the cause of that snake? It's the rope, and plus the ignorance of the rope which leads to the mistake of a snake. But, can I not say the rope is also actually, really speaking, the rope is not a cause of the snake because there is no snake. If it is really a product, something really happened, then you would have said, what is the cause of this happening? But if it did not happen, is it fair to the rope to say that, you, why are you a cause of a snake? The rope will say, I'm, what snake? I'm not a cause of any snake. It's born of error. That snake which we are seeing, it's born of error. Similarly, upon enlightenment, we will see the waking, dreaming and deep sleep worlds are born of error. One, re we, we realize the ultimate truth is the Thurium, always was and will be. It was there earlier, it is there now, it will continue to be. This world, 
The appearance will still continue, but we'll realize it's an appearance. All right. Then, about the meditation on Om, what did we learn? Quickly summarizing what we learned last time. Um, there were some karikas. We, uh, the karikas we're going to do now, but the Upanishad itself, the 8th mantra, ninth mantra, 10th mantra, and 11th mantras. What did they say? Each mantra told us three things. Um, especially the 9, 10, and 11. The 8th mantra introduced the analysis, and 9, 10, and 11 told us three things. One is, which letter to match to which aspect of the Atman? Which letter to match to which as aspect of the Atman? It, they are taught us a meditation technique. So, which letter to match to which aspect of the Atman? Then the second thing it taught us was similarities between the two. After all, why should I say, ah, oh, is the waking? I mean, there must be some kind of connection. So, a kind of connection was, established, was told to us. It, it was said that, a uh, and the waking state, the waking state and a uh, have the similarity of being adi and apte. We, we, you will see. If, if you don't remember, then you can look back at, at, at the verses. That it is the first, clearly it's the first, and it is pervading. Pervading, you remember why? Because it is the a uh sound alone which is underlying all other sounds. It's the a uh which is modified into. Uh, a, e. <laughs> just by making faces, you can, you can get all those sounds. Yes. So, that was the, the second thing is, no, first thing is why match these two? The first thing is which one matches with which, what? The second thing which was told to us, why? Similarities. And third thing which was told to us, the result of these practices. You might say the result is supposed to be enlightenment. I'm supposed to realize I am Turiya. Yes, that's the result. That's the ultimate result we are looking for. But remember, the traditional Vedic approach is, if somebody practices some kind of meditation, a result is mentioned. This is, going to, this is what you're going to do. Why is that so? Because all these practices originated from Vedic ritualism. The idea of the yajna, the, the fire sacrifices, the rituals. Where you do a sacrifice, where you do a practice, some ritual, with an expectation in mind. And the original ritualistic religion was, um, you know, people would perform rituals for somebody wanted to have an empire, somebody wanted to get rainfall for the crops, somebody would have wanted plentiful of cattle. And so why would people want plentiful of cattle? Remember, that was the wealth in those days. It was an agrarian society. Somebody wanted children, somebody wanted to go to heaven. So some result was looked for and that's why people performed rituals. Rituals were known, called karma and there were mental exercises called meditations, upasana. Karma and upasana. Mental exercise is also a kind of karma. So that also you had to give a result for that. Why do, if you do that, what will you get? So some results were mentioned for each of these meditations. You remember, one will... Uh, worldly and spiritual. The spiritual result is one, enlightenment. But the worldly results, the worldly results, multiple results were mentioned. The first part, if you, if you concentrate on A uh, as your waking word, you would get uh, yeah. apte, apte. No, knowledge would be the second one. Uh, the first one would, you would be first among many and you would be extensively rich and wealthy and, and so on. Um, you'd put on weight. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking. But basically, you become a bigger person. You, you're, you're pervade. Just as A uh, pervades all of this. So, anyway, that's, a, that's the way the result was mentioned. Then, um, so that was mentioned for each of them. What goes with what? What's the similarity between the two? The Om and the Self. The letters of the Om and the states of the Self. And what are the results? So these were mentioned. Now, before coming to the conclusion, what, what was the conclusion? The, uh, the eighth mantra introduced all of this. The ninth mantra said, took up this one, this part. The tenth mantra took up this part. And the eleventh mantra took up this last, this third part. 
And the last one, twelfth mantra, and the twelfth mantra is the last of, is the final mantra of the Upanishad. Remember, it's the smallest of the Upanishads. Only twelve mantras. So before, now we are coming to the twelfth mantra, but before that, you know, Gaurapada calls a halt, stop, once in a while. I hope you remember who Gaurapada is. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sankaracharya's Guru's Guru, yes. Um. There was this uh, poetic exchange between Swami Vivekananda and his uh, American disciple Mary Hale. Uh, quite humorous. It's part in it. You can find the poet, poems in Swami Vivekananda's uh, poems, collected poems where she tried to summarize Vivekananda's teachings and he humorously pointed out uh, some of the uh, glaring mistakes she made in trying, in trying to understand what he had taught. So she said something like, um, so you say everything is God. And he wrote back saying, unmeaning talk. This is, I never taught such strange doctrine that everything is God. What I meant was, God only is, everything is not. Look at this actually. What is everything? Everything is the entire waking world, the entire inner dream world or subtle world, and its causal state, all of these. That these three universes, the physical, the subtle, and the causal, these three universes are everything. So you're saying everything is God. Vivekananda is saying, I am saying everything is not. God only is. The Turiyam is the only reality. Right? It's like saying, um, I'll give you another example. Or the uh, classic example we have been using, the three, three ornaments and gold. Gold which is um, uh, made into a necklace, which is made into a bangle, which is made into a ring. And the fourth called gold. The fourth gold. So you have a bangle, a necklace and a ring and gold. Now, if somebody tells that, somebody says, everything, all the ornaments, um, the, the reality is all the ornaments, if you, if you say. You will say, no, we are saying the ornaments are not the reality, the reality is gold. Another way of putting it would be, suppose, the classic example of a, of a rope and snake. So suppose there's a rope, but somebody does not recognize it as a, as a rope. People come and in a distance they see that rope lying, but they don't know it's a rope. And what happens is, one of them says, oh look, there's a snake. And his friend says, no, 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 it's not a snake. It must be the garland thrown away from the nearby temple, garland. The third person says, no, it's a crack in the earth caused by the last um, earthquake. So three, three things they said. What are they? Snake, garland, crack in the earth. And this is the, actually the classic example. Sarpa, uh, Mala, Bhuchidra. Uh, the, these three alternatives. Now, would you say, if somebody says, I understand what you are trying to say. The reality is snake plus the garland plus the crack in the earth. And another person says, no, no, the reality is the rope. None of them. None of them are the reality. The reality is the rope. So that's what Vivekananda was saying. The reality is God. Let's put it in a general sense. Ultimate reality is there. The rest of it is not. Then what is the rest of it? It's that, that God alone, that Turiyam alone, that ultimate reality alone appearing in all of these ways. Anyway, why I'm saying all of this is, because at the beginning of the poem, he writes, In days of yore, on Ganga's shore, in ancient days, in, in, it's a very old uh, uh, Indian saying, in, uh, in ancient days, on the shore of the Ganga, there was a uh, Ramayan Katha, the telling of the tale of Rama, Rama and Sita. So some people sat and listened to the whole story. It's a long story. They listened to the whole story. And afterwards, they were wending their way back home. And one person was asking the other, um, that was really nice, but, but say, uh, but tell me, who's Sita? 
It's like a fundamental part of the story. How can you not know? It's like watching all the entire uh, uh, Star Wars thing and asking who's Luke Skywalker or who's Princess Leia. <laughs> so, who's Sita? It's like that uh, making a mistake. Vivekananda said, not that all three are the truth. The truth is this. Not that all the ornaments are the truth. The truth is the gold. Not that the snake and the crack in the earth or the rope uh, or the um, garland are the truth. The truth that is it's a rope. Ultimately, it's one consciousness appearing in these ways. Yes. So, in your previous, you know, when you were talking about, um, I'm just trying to understand. Yes. When you were talking about deep sleep as the cause mm. and thulium not being the cause of anything. Yes. So, can you give the example of the clay and the pots and the forms as yes. well as the ring, etc.? Golden so, ring, yes. It seems like the gold is the Mm -mm. Yes, it is true. That's what it seems like. There's a, you'll note, there's a question is, when you give examples like clay and pot, gold and ornament, in one sense the gold is the cause of the, cause means the substance, the material cause of the ornament, and the clay is the cause of the pot. That's why another example is given, rope and snake. There's a difference between rope, snake and the clay pot, right? And it used to bother me. Because the rope snake example seems to be quite, it seems to be what Vedanta is trying to say. But the clay pot example seems to be rather problematic. Don't you think? Because after all the clay is shaped into the pot, the gold is formed into an ornament. So is pure consciousness somehow shaped, transformed, changed into the world? Is it at all subject to change? But you keep saying it is unchangeable, it is un, uh, unchanging reality, there is no way of changing pure consciousness. Who or what would change pure consciousness? And what would it even be like changing of consciousness? Thoughts can change, things in the world can change. What is change of consciousness? The only thing it can become is non-conscious. So, um, we are back to that question. How do you say that the gold or the clay is not causes of uh, pot or ornament? Do you understand the question? Mm -hmm. To begin with, Vedanta will say it's a cause. But ultimately it will deny that it's not uh, and say that it's not a cause. And in fact we will come to that um, today itself. But let me just answer this. In what sense is the clay not a cause of the pot? In what sense is the gold not a cause of the, of the um, ornaments? In what sense are the clay pot and the gold ornament examples the same as rope snake? Rope snake is clear because there is no snake at all, ever. Uh, but we still say that there is a, there is a difference between the two examples because, um, remember, Rope and snake belong to two levels of reality. The rope belongs to the transactional level of reality, our level of reality. And the snake is produced by error. Whereas gold and uh, ornament, uh, clay and pot, all of them seem to belong to our level of reality. Not, it's not erroneous to call it a pot. It's not erroneous to call it an ornament. They are transactional. You can use it. People always use it. Remember, the, I mean, this is what used to bother me also. Finally, I, I resolved it this way. When the Upanishads use the clay and the pot example, which they do, the gold and the ornament example, they don't normally use the snake and rope example. When they use clay pot, gold, ornament, they mean it in this sense, in a one, uh, specific sense. They mean it this way. Um... First, I'll tell you the conclusion and then I'll give you the reasoning behind it. They will say there is no such thing as, an, as a pot. There is a thing called clay, but there is nothing called pot. There is a thing called gold, but there is nothing, no thing called a bracelet. How? Uh -huh. How? How? It's a dependent reality, but how? Uh, this will be useful in understanding the 12th mantra also today. It goes like this. The reasoning goes like this. Words are connected to things. So when you have a word, it expresses something. 
So book is a word which expresses this object. Is, this is the thing which is connected to the word book. You can put in Sanskrit terms it is like it is called Pada Padartha. Pada means word, Padartha means object. So every Pada, every word has a corresponding object or Padartha. Now when you analyze the object, um, say take up an object like a pot and you analyze it, you see that it is clay. Not that clay is a part of that pot. No, it is the whole of the pot. It is entirety. The entire pot, top, bottom, middle, outside, all of it is clay. Now if I ask you the question, what is the object? You, 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 uh, corresponding to the words clay and pot. If I ask you what is the object corresponding to the word clay, you will show me the pot. It's clay. Now show me the object corresponding to the word pot. Same. If you say it is same, why have two words for it? Ah, why have two words? If words, if words denote a thing, any kind of reality at all. The reality is the pot. The clay constituting the pot is the reality. The moment I say clay, I have taken away the entire reality of the pot. If say, show me clay, you should take the pot and say, yeah, this is clay. I say, okay, I'll take the clay away. Now show me the pot. You can't show me anything separately. They can't even be used inter interchangeably. Because the clay was clay even before it was a pot. The clay, even if you break the pot, it's still clay. At all stages it is clay. But the pot is not so. Pot is only applicable at a particular stage we are using the word pot. The basic point is there is no separate reality the word pot can point to. Since the padartha, the object is negated. The object turns out to be nothing but clay. Just the, the reality itself. Then the word pot remains without any object. It becomes objectless. The word pot becomes objectless in the sense of if you are, if you are very strict about what's real, what's substantial. If you hold on to the clay, then the word pot has nothing to point to. So it becomes a word without a reference, uh, without a referent. Um, something to point to. It's a word, you cannot point out the reality for it. I'll, I'll come to you. So in that case, the word itself is, is meaningless. Meaningless means without any object to refer to. Word is also dropped. It, it, has, it has nothing, it has no reality to point to. Does not mean it's not useful. It's still useful because it points to a name and a form and a use. A nama rupa vevahara is there. But the reality is not there because here we are, we are in quest of the reality. So in that sense the word pot has no thing it refers to. If there is no thing it refers to, then how is a clay a cause? What is it a cause of? How is the clay a cause? What, do you get it? What is it? This is the thinking of, this is a very subtle way of thinking. What is, just hold on to the reality itself. Take it in a very direct, simple way. What did the clay produce? Show me the thing produced by the clay. You can't. You can't. So there is no separate thing produced by the clay. Hence the word pot does not refer to a product. And therefore the word clay does not refer to a cause also. The clay remains as something apart from cause and effect. This is an example. In the same way, Turiyam is actually not the cause of the universe. Because there is no real universe. They are all there, they all appear, but they, don't, they are not real things apart from Turiyam. Hence you can't say Turiyam produced something. Hence Turiyam is not a cause. It is neither cause nor effect. The whole game of cause and effect is within Maya. This is within Maya. But the reality is beyond cause and effect. Vivekananda himself expressed this. Hold on to the question, I'll come to you. Vivekananda himself expressed it this way. I've quoted him earlier. You know, the law of karma is basically cause and effect. Whatever we do, we get the result of that. That good, good, bad, bad, and none escape the law. Hmm? Uh, whosoever wears a form wears the chain too. The chain is the chain of cause and effect. Causes uh, have actions, have consequences, causes have effects. 
But then he says, far beyond name and form is Atman ever free. Far beyond cause and effect. What is cause? This one. What is effect? These. Far beyond cause and effect is Atman ever free. No, thou art that sannyasi bold. Say Om Tat Sat Om. So the direct answer to your question is, when the Upanishads use the example of pot and clay, gold and ornament, they have their eye on one point only, that the substance, the reality behind it. So don't we think about a potter making a pot, um, a jeweler making jewels. Uh, don't go into that. That's misleading. I also used to think like that. I would say that they are not the same example. But they are the same example as far as the reality is concerned. Just as the rope is the only reality. Not the snake, not the crack in the ground, not the discarded garland. The uh, rope is the only reality. The gold is the only reality. And in the same way, the clay is the only reality. In this sense. We will use this reasoning. Keep it in mind. We'll use it when we come to the end of this. Yes. You had a question. I'm sorry, I made you forget it. No, <laughs> that happens. <laughs> Yeah. I'm thinking about the pot as the function. Yes. So, what about the clay function? Or is that validated? The clay, see, it's the potentiality of um, many functions. You can make many kinds of pots and jars and things out of it. Um, the pot is valid for us because it has a particular functionality. When you make a pot out of a clay, you gain a new form, a new name. And a new function. You can hold, you can put water in it, you can put milk in it, or you can, you know, which you cannot do with clay. So that's the functionality of the pot. But what Vedanta says is, we are not interested in that. It's very useful for the world. That's why Vedanta is not very particularly very useful. <laughs> it points to something beyond worldly use. It points to the reality of the, uh, of the pot. The reality of the pot is still clay. As clay, as clay does not have that functionality of the pot. So, Maya, for example, is very useful. Maya produces all of this. Names and forms and people. You can have the game of samsara with Maya. But the underlying reality is Turiyam. Turiyam as such, you cannot have functionality there. Uh, in itself. It has no specific use. It's called Abhyavaharyam, beyond transaction or beyond use. Or to be to put it very bluntly useless. <laughs> it's useless in the sense that the clay is useless. But is the clay really useless? Is the clay is the is the potentially the place, the ground of all use, all kinds of things which can be done with clay, that's what's there, potentially. You have to make it. Similarly, Turium. That ultimate reality is potentially the source of the entire universe. Only thing Vedanta insists is the reality is a Turiyam, not the universe. Don't worry, we, will, we have got several chapters. Gaudapada will take us through it step by step. Yes, I'll come to you. So the Turiyam does not, our, our clay does not make the pot. No. Maya makes the pot. Uh, yeah, the potter makes the pot. Or and the in the same way, is, yeah. But remember, from Vedantic point of view, you are interested in the reality. So there is no such thing as a pot which is made. If you actually, yes. Because if you make it, then you must show me that there is something real that you have made. The reality is the, is the clay. I, I, have a, I have a trouble with the word God. Yes. Because God has been, the word has been so misused. True. So long. And, and, and. Well, I don't have to, have to detail the horrible things that have been done true, in the name of God. True, true. This God, Arturium, mm. which we call God, doesn't do any of those things. No, absolutely not. Doesn't do anything. In fact, God, I'm using the most broadest sense, the old word I'm using for Turium, it's not a word that should be used for Turium. Oh. The word which should be used for Turium is the absolute. Okay. Yeah. What is God in this entire scheme of things, if at all? The closest that we get to God in this entire scheme of things is the totality. See, so in the waking state, I am an individual. Here is this entire world. I am an individual meaning 
I am a consciousness associated with this body and mind. Alright? This is called a jiva. Now, conceive of consciousness associated with all bodies and minds and indeed the entire insentient universe. A consciousness which can associate, which can identify itself with the entire universe. Everybody and everything. That would be the Virat, the, the gross manifestation of God. At this subtle level, I am a con that same consciousness associated with one mind, this particular mind. Imagine the same consciousness associated with, which can associate it means identified, it can call it mine. Like I call this one, my mind. Uh, my mind is happy, my mind is sad, uh, my mind does not understand, like that. If consciousness could call all our minds together, just conceive of that, the entire cosmic mind, you're plugged into not only your laptop, but the entire internet. Uh, so if you could associate with all minds, that would be the subtle manifestation of God, subtle aspect of God. This is Hiranyagarbha. Now, the potential state. In deep sleep, I am the individual who has shut down in deep sleep. Imagine a consciousness which is associated with the shutting down of the universe in a potential state before the Big Bang, let us say, or after the end of the cycle of the universe. That is God in the potential state. It is called Ishwara, which is uh, conceived of in, or depicted in Hindu mythology as Vishnu in sleep. So he, Vishnu is a bit of a couch potato. He's all, he, he, has a, he has a magnificent couch, the cosmic serpent with a thousand uh, hoods. But, but it shows the potential state, the, the corresponding to our deep sleep, when the entire universe vanishes, when Ishwara, Vishnu alone is there with Vishnu's power of projecting the subtle universe and the gross universe. So this is the idea of God. In Vedanta, you will see the idea of God is very precise. Mostly in theistic religions, you will see God is hidden in the veil of mystery. A lot of words are used, but what is the precise meaning of the words? Nobody agrees exactly. It's mysterious. It's evocative. It's poetic. It points, it's theological points to articles of faith and inspiration and belief. But here it's a very, very clear cut kind of uh, paradigm. What is, what are you? You are that consciousness. That one consciousness with this particular body and mind. What is God? The same consciousness with the entirety of the universe. That's God. That's what Arjuna experiences in the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, which terrifies him <laughs> to see this the cosmic form of God. But this God does not act. Oh, God, oh, it, it acts. It, it just, just punish you or no. reward you. No, punishment and reward is not a concept in Hinduism. In Vedanta, the, the idea is rather cause and effect. Uh, punishment and reward is a very personal kind of, it sounds very personal. That's why it's, uh, people find it objectionable. In the Indian philosophies, it's more cause and effect, karma. God is more or less like a benign bank manager who gives you whatever is, is in your credit or debit, you know, or calls in the bad loans when he has to call in. But, um, see, what I get from the bank is what I actually earned. And if there's nothing I, can't, I can get, well, I have to admit I have maxed out my credit cards. So that's what God does, basically. But God is better than most bank managers because God, God is, can give you a very long line of credit indeed. And God can help you to come out of this entire system between beyond cause and effect to oneness with God. So oneness with God does not mean you become God, rather you go beyond God to the reality which, which is behind beyond God, the absolute. Yeah. Uh, in one sense, God is nothing other than you. Uh, it, it is uh, your cosmic aspect. If you knew yourself as the real you, both an individual God and the world, God, individual and world, Jagat, Jiva, Ishwara, they would all be manifestations of you alone. Well, well then it if Ramakrishna says something like, which I think I heard you say that he said, but we quoted him once, that you, you shouldn't uh, preach or uh, unless God has given you permission, I yes. told you to preach. Yes. So this God is that's a different kind of God, or 
how is this real? No, it's the same God. It's Ishwara. There's only one God. Exactly. So it, it's the same thing. So God and is... God did something. Yes. So God does act. For example, God takes incarnations. See, um, Turiya does not act. The, uh, the, the uh, ultimate reality is beyond action. There's no action there at all. It's perfection. But in the world of Maya, in the world of Maya, Vedanta admits here is a world, here you are as an individual, and here there is a God with the power of God, and a benign, loving God, just God. But what Vedanta points is the reality is beyond all of that. God is not the ultimate reality. It's a, as bold as that. Since you yourself are not the ultimate reality, uh, the world is not the ultimate reality, God is also not the ultimate reality. Beyond all three are, is one reality which is your own real nature. You as you are not the ultimate reality, but deep inside you or your own actual reality is the ultimate reality of God and the universe also. The absolute. The absolute. And you are the absolute. God is not the absolute. You are the absolute. Or in another way, you can say ultimately God is also the absolute. But basically, the absolute to find absolute, you have to find search within yourself. All right. You had a question. Yes. I'll come to you. Um, I understand Maturium, but what about Vritti? What's the difference between the two? Maturium and Vritti. Vritti. Vritti is a Vritti means modification, movement. So movement of the mind. Mm -hmm. Literally in Sanskrit, Vritti means change. So I raise my hand. This is a Vritti. I walk, this is a vritti. Vritti means change. But here chitta vritti means vritti of the mind, movement of the mind. You think something, you feel something, you see something, hear something, they are all vrittis. Turiyam is the consciousness behind all the vritti, vrittis, which lights up all the vrittis. I think I'm still confused about the source idea. It almost seems like Vedanta is resisting, saying that Turiyam is not the source for anything. Hmm. Right. In fact, that is, that is the ultimate position of Vedanta. But still, Swamiji, we are spending so much time talking about the individual state and waking Correct. up and, and Virat and all of that. Correct. And then you introduce the idea of Maya, yes. which together makes that happen. Yes. So it almost seems like they're two different things, and Maya becomes, you know, sort of the Christian idea of Satan versus God. No, no, no. Maya is the power of God. There are, there's no duality here. There's only one ultimate reality, which is Turiyam. But the point is that we are very far from that. We are trapped in this appearance. So all of this, remember, this is something called superimposition and desuperimposition. Vivekananda calls it hypnotization and dehypnotization. It's a structure is being set up to skillfully lead us out of the trap we are ourselves in. Otherwise, if you want the truth straight away, without any talk of anything else. You are Brahman, finished. Uh, uh, the Upanishad itself said, I am Atma Brahma. Uh, you see at the beginning of the Upanishad, this very self is the absolute. But how does that help us? Because we don't even understand what the absolute is. And let alone understanding myself as the absolute. Yeah. But, but the power of Maya, yes. the power of God, hmm. of Turi and Maya, that is the source. No. That is the source of all of this manifestation. But what, what um, the Upanishad is saying that the manifestation is not real. It's like, it's like, just take the example of the rope and the, all the varieties of mistakes we make about the rope. The snake, the garland, the crack in the earth. Now the source of all of them is error. The source of error is ignorance. So compare that ignorance to Maya. Maya is the magician which makes Turiyam appear in all these ways. So it's more like a magic. More like a magic. So the source is not in Turiyam. Turiyam itself is, is, has, has no Maya. Maya is at the causal level. When you ask the question, what makes all this happen? Maya. So is Maya real? Ultimately, no. There's no Turiyam plus Maya. There's only Turiyam. Maya is well within the realm of appearance. The, at the source is Maya, its products are all of this. But neither the source nor the product are real. The <laughs> reality ultimately is Turiyam. It, it's like saying, snake, garland, crack in the earth, 
all our appearances at the source of that is ignorance and quite appear, apart from ignorance and its appearances is the, uh, the innocent rope which is real. So you are the innocent turium which is real, always was, is and will be and all of this is a game within you. It will still go on but it is to be recognized as a game, as a movie. Um, later on we'll come uh, to in the second chapter of, of uh, the Mandukya where Gaudapada will say consider this universe which you experience, consider it as, um, as Swapna, dream, consider it as a dream, consider it as Maya, like a magic show, consider it as a Gandharva Nagara, like a castle in the air, like you see clouds in various forms. So they are not real, they are appearances. Vedanta never goes beyond what you experience because we experience all this. This Vedanta will never say, for example, Vedanta will never say, what world? You see that I am seeing it. Vedanta will say, no you are not. <laughs> that Vedanta will never say, something like that. You, you cannot deny that you are seeing it. But what are you seeing? What is the nature of that? Is it real? That's what Vedanta investigates. Uh, I'll come to you. You had a point? Sorry, then on this slide, there is no creation and no dissolution. Absolutely. Do you, have you heard the talk I gave, the ultimate truth? What you are saying is exactly what Gaudapada says. Towards the end of the second chapter, we'll come to that eventually, hopefully. He says, there is no dissolution, no creation. Then what about our bondage and all of this? There is no bondage. Then what about me? I am in bondage. There is nobody in bondage. Then what about all the spiritual practice we are doing, Vedanta classes and meditation and prayer? There is nobody doing any spiritual practices. And then he says, what about those who are liberated? There is nobody who is liberated. And then, Paramarthata, this is the absolute truth. That's what it will come to, ultimately. Uh, and not only that, he goes, there is a small word there, Itti Esha. It says, this is the absolute truth. This means, this what you are experiencing. This is the absolute truth. While experiencing it, you know, it, it points you to the thurium which is there, which is here, the ground of all experience. That alone is real. The rest of it is magic show. Is fun, entertainment. So you don't have to take it seriously. Until you realize that. I mean, uh, until you realize that, you pretty well you should take it seriously. <laughs> <laughs> if, why? Why? Beca why? Because if it hurts, if suffering is a problem, if desire is a problem, if greed is a problem, anger is a problem, if we are suffering in samsara, there is no use saying that I will not take it seriously. You are taking it seriously. You are helplessly taking it seriously. Then this is a way of getting out of that. Once you have gotten out of that, the whole thing is fun. From that perspective. But if you are a part of the drama, in the nightmare, when you wake up you say, oh thank God it was nightmare, nothing else. But in the nightmare, it was pretty, pretty serious. You are terrified, you are anxious, you are running away from the tiger chasing you. When you wake up, you can laugh at it. Oh, thank God. Uh, it must have been the burrito which I ate last night or something. Uh, but, but before that, you need to wake up from that. Waking up from that is this. Swamiji, so, I mean, you almost have, you answered it really. The question was so... There is really no Krishna, no Vishnu. Mm, wait, just a minute. Before you, before you deny Krishna and Vishnu, you should be able to deny your own personal existence. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, yeah. No, I, I mean, once you reach that stage, because if there is no creation, no dissolution, yes. that means there is none of that. No? Yes. And my follow-up is then, when Sri Thakur experienced the Divine Mother, hmm. or when he asked, Swami Vivekananda to go and pray to her, you know, and he was worried about the house and Swamiji couldn't pray at all, hmm. uh, or rather ask her for things for his family. Now, what were those? Were they experiences? See, that's why this is a very dangerous philosophy. <laughs> look, at, look at the, do you know the story? When Narendranath, the young man who later became Swami Vivekananda, his father died and they were in terrible uh, debt. And he couldn't get a job and his family was suffering, mother and his brothers and sisters. He was in dire straits. And he went to Sri Ramakrishna and he said, can't you ask your divine mother Kali? Because she is the source of the entire universe. She is here. 
so she's the source of the entire universe. So can't you ask her to make things right for my family? Sri Ramakrishna said, look, I don't ask for such things. But you can go. Today is a nice day. It was a Tuesday. Uh, it's, a holy, uh, it's a divine mother's day. Tuesdays and Saturdays. So you can, it's a Tuesday. You can go and ask tonight. Go and ask the divine mother. She's the mother of the universe. She'll give you what you, what you want. And so he was persuaded to do that. He went and he had a vision of the Divine Mother. It was not an image. It was a living presence. The Mother of the Universe sh- shone forth in the temple. And he asked for um, knowledge, jnana. He asked for bhakti, devotion, discrimination, viveka, that to know the difference between the real and the unreal and so on. He came back, overwhelmed by this vision. And he told Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna said, that's all very good, but did you ask for a job and money? And, <laughs> and he said, I, 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 I totally forgot. Sri Ramakrishna said, you foolish boy, there's still time, go and ask. So he went back a second time. The same thing happened. He couldn't ask for worldly things. He just asked for love and devotion and, and spiritual knowledge, enlightenment, and he came back. Sri Ramakrishna again scolded him, go and ask for money, go. A third time. Third time also he came back and then he said, I couldn't do it. And he said, I realized this is, you are tricking me. This is all you're doing. Uh, Sri Ramakrishna was very happy because this, is, this was a test he put Narendranath to. Does this boy, even under pressure, does this boy want, really want the world? Do you want the world or do you want God? And so finally Sri Ramakrishna blessed him, said that, um, told him that he was happy with this, what, what he had done. And blessed him that, well, all right, your family shall not lack. They will not suffer for want of simple uh, clothing and food. He didn't uh, say say that they'll all become millionaires. They'll have a simple uh, life. Yes, that that much he, he blessed them. Now, her question is, if there's ultimately no God or Vishnu or all of that, if I'm the absolute Turiyam, then why did Sri Ramakrishna tell Narendranath to go and ask Mother Kali for, what did you say, the house and the job and the money and all of that? The answer is within your question, don't you think? When Narendranath is coming and asking Sri Ramakrishna, is he asking, am I the ultimate reality? He's not asking that. He's asking, how do I get a job? How do I feed my mother and my... If you're Turiyam, what mother and what job and what house does Turiyam has a, have a mother? Is Turiyam looking for, is on, the, uh, is on, on welfare, looking for a job? Uh, has Turiyam been laid off? <laughs> no. When you are asking all of that, you are well within the universe. You are asking in terms of the universe, taking it to be real. Not only that, you are well within the waking universe. If... Sri Ramakrishna says, yeah, you'll have a job in your dreams. <laughs> that wouldn't have satisfied Narendranath. He would, say, he would say, I want a job in the waking world where I can feed my mother and my brother and, and sisters. So in the waking world, Narendranath wants the world to be this way rather than that way. Take it for granted. That's why this is such a dangerous philosophy. We are well entrenched in the waking world. We are really entrenched in the waking world. Here, from here, we are trying to dismiss all of it. Dangerous. Won't work. I am here, but it's all false. I am this body, I am this person, this is my job, this is my house, my city, my problems, and yet it's all false. You can't do that. You have to step back into the witness consciousness and then dismiss all appearances as appearances. It will still continue but as appearances. So that's why this ultimate, the background consciousness, Turiyam, has to be realized, at least least intellectually understood. Then all questions have to be reformulated from that perspective. You will see all of it uh, dissolve, questions dissolve then. But as long as you are here, then this is real for you at this point. And this source is also real. What, What does an atheist deny? An atheist denies the existence of something like this. What does a theist believe in? A theist believes in the existence of something like this. What is Mandukya? Not interested in theism and atheism. 
both theism and atheism for Mandukya are appearances in one consciousness. So a theist says that there is God or Vishnu or Kali which is the cause of all of this. If you want a change in your virtual reality, you have to ask the programmer, make a change in my virtual reality. I want a better virtual reality. But the, what Mandukya is telling you is that it's a virtual reality. Step out of the matrix. Or I'll come to you. I'll come to you, yes. So the, uh, the waking, sleeping and dreaming states can be experienced. Yes. And, uh, and they are real, as you say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> in, in, in the, in the I can st- stipulate that they are real. I can, I, can, I can grant that they are real for purposes of the question, yes. yes. yes, yes. <laughs> but but uh, uh, God, as defined as Saguna Brahman, yes. I cannot experience that. No. So why, what is the postulate? What, what is, is God a postulate in that sense? Correct. It, you, have, you have intelligently pointed this out. I have, I have myself pointed it out on a couple of occasions earlier. I have always claimed that we are moving on the basis of experience and reason, right? Yet there is one thing here which is somewhat a matter of faith. What is God here? You see, that we experience the universe as individuals and as a totality. That's also not, not uh, beyond uh, reason and experience because... I am a part of this. I can see myself as this body and mind as a part. And here is a total. I can, I can conceive of the totality of all of this. I can even conceive of the totality of all minds. Though I experience only my own mind. But I can conceive of the totality of all minds. I am a consciousness associated with the body and mind. That's also part of my, that's my experience. That's the basis of my experience. Now here is the faith factor involved here. They are saying, the Upanishad says, that just as you are the consciousness associated with that body and mind, and each of us is a consciousness associated with particular bodies and minds in the waking world, there is this consciousness associated with all bodies and minds. You'll say, aha, but how do I know that? That's, you take it on faith. So in that case, uh, would a faithless person not be able to realize Turyam? Absolutely not. There's no problem. Because ultimately... The God which you are taking on faith. Suppose you don't believe in such a God. Though it's pretty eminently reasonable. If there is the individual and the total. And the individual is associated with consciousness. It's quite possible. At least the possibility is that that the consciousness might be associated with the totality. But supposing you say that consciousness in my experience is associated with me. At the most I can extend it to all of you. Consciousness is associated with each of you. But there is one consciousness associated with all at the same time. I, um, I choose not to believe in such a thing because it would be a matter of faith. If you say that, if you take that position, still it does not prevent you from realizing the Turiyam behind yourself. Right? But this is taken into account. First of all, Vedanta firmly believes that there is such a God. Though ultimately dismisses that God also. And if you do not, what about all those people who believe in God, then their question about God still remains as unresolved. Where is God in this whole system? So God is given this portfolio in this whole system. You are in charge of the totality. I am here with the sing- uh, individual. You are in charge of the totality. It's definitely, let's be honest about it. Math- there is an element of faith involved in it. A strong element of faith. But the beauty about the Advaitic approach is, ultimately nothing much hangs on that. If you are going to be religious, then it hangs on. Then all of religion depends on that faith. All of theistic religion depends on that faith. If you are going to be a Buddhist or a yogi or a Sankhyan, not really necessary. But does religion get you to Turyam? Religion is enormously useful. And the core of religion, if you take Mandukya Upanishad as the core of Vedanta, of, of Hinduism, in that sense, yes. Suppose you take the Mandukya by itself. And so religion is like a philosophy. Of, uh, no, the Manduk is the philosophy. Right? Manduk is the philosophy. It's the philosophy of religion. It is the, un- I would say, it is the core philosophy of Hinduism. And I would extend it further. 
this Vedantic framework which we are giving, Vivekananda believed, and I, I think it's pretty reasonable to say, it is basically the underlying rationale of religion. What is ultimately religion trying to do? It's basically this. Now it's clearly, very clearly stated here, in this way, in a very stark way it is stated here. In principle, if I did not believe in God and theistic religion, that's what you're basically asking, would it do me any harm? You would have to disregard part of Mandukya, but that part of Mandukya is not the essence. Still, your experience of waking, dreaming and deep sleep and Turiya would remain the same. That remains the same. It is not affected so much. But that's only in principle. In practice, it makes a huge difference. Because even Mandukya Upanishad would say, the preparation necessary for realizing this uh, Vedantic truth, that I am the Turiyam, the preparation requires purification of mind, it requires unselfishness, concentration, all of which are given by religion. The, the initial preparation towards Mandukya. Here we have jumped to the top of the mountain. The entire base, camp and everything is conventional religion. Um, you have to be, suppose I, I don't believe in all of that, but I am a moral person, I am a pretty concentrated person, I have a clear mind, will it help me? Then it's all right. Moral, focused, clear thinking, um, willpower which I can exercise and bring my life under control and discipline. If I have got all of that, then I don't need the preparatory things. Yeah. One second, I'll come. All right, that's the last question. We have, we have not started today's class yet. <laughs> yes. Construct that we have defined over here as defined by Mandukya. What yeah. is that vision? What is that vision? Is this, this one? Uh, Ishwara? How are you getting a vision? Who is making this vision happen? Is this all in the mind? No, 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 no. Remember, all of this is not just in the mind. The mind is very much part of it. All of this is in Turiya. The mind is very much part of it. It's here at the subtle level. Beyond the subtle level is the causal level. At the causal cosmic level is Kali, the Divine Mother. Yes. This one, Ishwara, consciousness associated with the entire universe. Yes. So, it's not real. Then Turiyam alone is real. In that, see, in the Turiyam uh, um, paradigm, God, God's grace, anything possible, none of those words have any relevance anymore. In in the Turiyam uh, point of view. So, suppose you say, I'll reframe your question. Suppose one really does realize that. Turiyam is the reality and I am that Turiyam. Then, would all of these words of Ramakrishna have any meaning? No. That's your question. Now, ah, right. So, from the person who has realized that I am Turiyam, that person, how would that person look upon the world and God as appearances in the Turiyam that he is? I am Turiyam, not as the person. I am the ultimate, the absolute existence consciousness bliss. In that existence consciousness bliss, it appears as so many individuals, including this individual. It also appears as the totality associated with all of it as God. All those appearances continue. And as an individual in this, in this, entire, um, in this entire appearance, I could still have devotion to the, the, the cosmic aspect, because all of it would be me also, you know. It's not a separate movie which I am watching. I am all of this. I am the movie. If, if I, I am real and in me all of this is happening, I can still continue to play the role of a devotee. Sri Ramakrishna said, after realizing this, remain with Bhakti Bhakto Bhagavan. Remain in this. You are ultimately you're back to this kind of an experience. Though you know the reality story, what will you continue to experience? I am this person. Here is the world, you know, the Kali temple and the Ganges, and I'm, I'm, I am, I uh, am, um, yes. <laughs> yeah. no, that's God. 
that, that's a, that's a, a, a protest from God. In spite of what all you do, I'm still around. <laughs> all right. It's not like I woke up from a dream and all that is gone now. So the God in the dream and the world in the dream and the person in the dream all are falsified. I have nothing to do. No, no. All of you, uh, all of that is still appearing and it's all you, the Turiyam. So you can continue to play the game. Uh, not in the sense of falsity, you can pl continue to play the game as identification with Turiyam and sense of oneness. Then the individual, which I find myself back into, will be, can remain as a devotee of God also. Oh, that's hard to grasp. Yeah. Or, okay, just uh, 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 tell me this and then I'll, uh, you will see how it falls into place. Suppose you realize that you are the Thurium, which itself was, is now, you are back again in this waking world, you realize that you are this Thurium, but by realizing that Thurium and then experiencing the waking world, what will happen is that you will see that I am the consciousness which is now appearing as this entire waking universe and as this individual. That will be your, that will be your knowledge, understanding of the whole situation, very clear. All right, then as the individual being, what would you now try to think of yourself as? Earlier, you're thinking of yourself as Deepak, this person, son of so-and-so, born in such and such place. This is your life story as Deepak. Now you realize the Deepak persona is there, but behind it is your real, real nature, Turiyam, which alone is appearing as Deepak and Deepak's world. Now what would you say, what would be the honest understanding about yourself? I am? Fill in the blanks. I am? Turiyam. I am Turiyam. I am existence, consciousness, bliss. All of these would be true to you then. Not only an interesting philosophy, but, but true. Right? That I which is saying that, isn't that a function of the mind? Because the body is appearing, the mind is appearing. So you continue to live your life as that person from all outer aspects as you are still the person Deepak. But that I in, in the mind says, I am Satchidananda, I am Turiyam, I am the Absolute. This person will go on its, uh, you know, its, its uh, term of life and so on. But I am the background awareness existence be, behind all of this. Would you agree that would be the way to look at it if you found yourself back again uh, here in this world? Sri Ramakrishna says, in fact, that's correct. That even after the enlightenment, as long as the body, the body of the enlightened person continues, that enlightened person will also continue to e experience himself as an individual in a world. But as an enlightened individual. If the body experience continues, the mind experience also will continue. It's not that the an, an enlightened person is a zombie, a body without a mind. The mind is also there. If the mind is there, the ego also will be there. I. That ego now, what will that ego think of itself? Earlier, what did it think of itself? Body-mind. Now, what does it think of itself? Sri Ramakrishna says, two ways are possible. One way is, the jnani is I. I am pure consciousness. He says this. It's in the sayings of Ramakrishna, number three. Swami Brahmananda's collection. Third collection. After enlightenment, the enlightened person continues to live. The ego of that enlightened person, he calls it the ripened ego. The ripened ego, he says, Pakaami. The Pakaami, he says, ripened ego has two forms. One is a knowledge form, one is a devotional form. The knowledge form will say, I am pure consciousness. Though I continue to appear in all these, these ways. The necklace can say, I am gold. And it would not be false, right? It would be true actually, I am gold. Others will continue to say, no, no, you are a necklace and I am a bracelet and that other guy is a, is a ring. And the necklace says, no, no, I am gold and you are gold too and that other guy is also gold. And the necklace would be right, then it's an enlightened necklace. <laughs> so, so I would continue as, the, as I am pure consciousness. That's one form. And Sri Ramakrishna says, another form is possible for that enlightened I. I am the child of God. I am the servant of God. That's also an enlightened point of view. It's not the Mandukya framework, but it's a devotional framework. That, that one is also ripened ego. But isn't Sri Ramakrishna himself an example of how a human being who is self-realized, because he never refers to his body as oh. mind. He's an example, of course. So 
so of course you think so. How, that's an example of how self realized. So yeah. We live in a world True. But remember, here we are taking a particular paradigm. That's what he's asking is, from this paradigm, it doesn't seem to make sense. Sri Ramakrishna, after enlightenment, he says, I am the child and uh, there's, Kali is my divine mother. Because this paradigm says, I am Turiyam and Kali is an appearance in me. Right? That's what he's asking. So from this perspective, you will continue to live as, I am pure consciousness. Ramakrishna as an avatar embodied the entire spectrum of enlightenment. It can be in many ways. This is not the only way. Though in Mandukya class we will insist this is the highest. A devotee of Krishna or Kali would say, Fu to your Mandukya. I, I am the child of the divine or I am the, or I am the, uh, the devotee of Krishna. I am Hanuman, the servant of Rama. Uh, so, <laughs> I, I don't care for your waking, dreaming and deep sleep. <laughs> So that's a devotional approach. And Sri Ramakrishna says both are correct. There's, um, there's no problem with either of them. Can we, yeah? Why do you say, I am Turian and Kali is an appearance in me? Hmm. Why cannot it be that Kali is also Turian? Kali is also Turian. Then the world is also Turian. But if I am Turian, then, um, yeah, in that sense, of course, Kali is also Turian. That is true. Um, Kali is Turian. But if you say Kali as the creator of the world, as, uh, uh, as a deity, the Absolute appears as Kali. In that sense, my ultimate reality is none other than Kali. Kali and I share the ultimate reality. But, in this, but his question still stands. In this point of view, you would not say, I am the child of Kali. But from a devotee's point of view, you could easily say, I am a child of Kali. Yeah. So it would continue. But this is one framework. Okay. That's why I remember when Sri Ramakrishna, I say, he embodies the entire spectrum of spiritual realization. That's why if you try to put some other part of the spectrum into this, you will find a, a, a contradiction, a clash. Um, this is one way of looking at it. Appreciate it for its own sake, in its own merits, and then we can match. Yeah. Suppose you take someone like Ramana Maharshi. It will easily fit in this paradigm. Hmm. Because he embodies a particular kind of realization. Totapuri, oh, very well. Totapuri, you see how he resisted <laughs> the, the whole Kali paradigm. But Sri Ramakrishna, you see how smoothly he moves between all paradigms. That's the sign of the avatar because he sees it, the, the whole thing. He told the story of a um, person, people who passed by a tree and they saw a wonderful creature. And they came back to the village and said, Oh, there's a tree and there's a fantastic creature which lives on, lives on the tree and it's green. And his friend said, I saw it, but you're wrong, it's not green, it's red. And the friend said, but I saw it too, but it's not red or green, it's yellow. Then they went to the tree and they found one person living under the tree. So they asked him and said, yes, there is such a creature which lives here. It's a chameleon. And you are all right. It is sometimes green, sometimes red, sometimes yellow, sometimes it's colorless. Beyond all qualities. And all of them are true. So, meaning thereby Sri Ramakrishna is the person who lives under the tree. But if you see it in any one of its colors, you are free. It's done for you. This is the colorless way of seeing it. Alright, let's quickly um, do a little more. Let's go into the Karikas, which follows the Upanishadic mantras 8, 9, 10 and 11. So, the Karikas, Karika number 19. Remember, all of this is reference to the Upanishadic mantras we did last time. It refers to Om meditation. Vishwasyatva vivakshayam Vishwasyatva vivakshayam Adi samanyam utkatam Adi samanyam utkatam Matra samprati patausyad Matra samprati patausyad Apti samanyam evacha Apti samanyam evacha So when the identity of the Vishwa with the letter A is intended, when you meditate upon their identity, then the similarity of being the first, the similarity of all pervasiveness, these become clear. 
what is Gaudapada doing? In the next few karikas, he will just summarize what we have learned. So I can go through them pretty quickly. In this karika, what did he say? When you meditate upon the identity of Vishwa, the waker, with the sound A, uh, which is the constituent of Om. Then, the similarity of these two. What were the similarity? You have to recall what we learned. The similarity is, it is first. Uh, the, the cosmic waker, Virat, is supposed to be the first of the gods to emerge. Brahma Devanam Prathamasambhuva or Tasmad Virada Jayata is from the Upanishads there. And A is the first of the sounds to emerge. So in that sense, they are same. Another similarity, do you remember? Pervasive. Virat, the cosmic waker, pervades the entire universe. Similarly, A pervades all sounds. So he says here, 19th Karika, Vishwasya Atva Vivakshaya. When you say Vishwa, the waker, is a, should be meditated upon as a. Vivakshaya means when the intention is to say that. What it means is, some matra sampratipatto. You meditate on their identification. Meditate on a as the entire universe. The little sound a, you take it as, just in your association, in your mind, as the whole waking universe. All stars and planets, down to quarks and protons and neutrons and whatnot, all of it is A. Ah. And then you meditate. Remember, just as a note I've told you earlier, don't meditate separately as A, ah, I'm doing A ah meditation, what's wrong with you? Or Ooh, is does something hurt? No. <laughs> when you meditate, it should always be Om. But when you meditate on the waking world and equivalence with a, uh, intention is that, then you are doing this a uh, meditation, the first. When you meditate upon om, with the emphasis on the u, that all thoughts or the entire mental universe is om, then you are doing the u meditation. Then when you meditate upon the m, mm, that the entire causal universe is m, mm, then you are doing the that M, the M meditation. But you are all the time actually chanting or thinking of Om only. Then the next one. Number 20. What's going on? Revision. What we have done already. Taija sasyotva vijjana Taija sasyotva vijjana Utkarsho drishyate sputam Utkarsho drishyate sputam Matra Samprati Pattosyat Matra Samprati Pattosyat Ubhayatvam Tathavidham Ubhayatvam Tathavidham Similarly, when you are comprehending Taijas, the dreamer, as U, that is when you meditate on the identity of U with the dreamer and the dream universe. Then the two, sim two similarities. What are the similarities? Utkarsha, excellence. So, U excels A. Uh, say how? Because it is the sound A uh, alone which evolves into the U. You change the formation of your lips, A uh becomes U. A uh, becomes U. So, it evolves. Similarly, the, um, the subtle universe, the dreamer, the deep uh, in, in dream, the subtle universe, the, the, uh, the world of thoughts, because it's subtler than the physical universe, because it is all pervasive, it is also, it's finer, subtler, all pervasive, more powerful. In Sanskrit, sukshmatvat, vyapakatvat, karanatvat, it is the cause of this, this one also. So because of that, the, the world of the, basically the world of the mind is, is superior to the world of matter. That's what it says. So that's why it's superior. Another reason, ubhayatvam. It's in the middle, literally so, between A and U, it's in A and M, U is in the middle. Similarly, between the gross and the causal, gross and causal, the dream or uh, the mental, subtle, is in the middle. In that sense, Ubhayatvam. Then, 21. The third one, M. Mm. 
Why all this talking? He's preparing us for silence. Which is coming here last. Makara bhave pragyasya Makara bhave pragyasya Manasamanya mutkatam Manasamanya mutkatam Matra sampreti patoutu Matra sampreti patoutu Laya samanya me vacha Laya samanya me vacha When you're speaking about the deep sleeper and its identity with M, mm, that means when you're meditating, sampratipatti means meditation, meditating on the identity of deep sleeper and M, mm, two things become clear, two similarities. Do you remember what were the two similarities? One is miti and one is apiti. You remember from the um, nine, ten, uh, eight, nine, ten, 11th mantra. Do you remember the measuring cup? Unforgettable example where uh, the, all the measures of rice being poured out, it disappears into the cup and then comes out of the cup. Similarly, consider the deep sleep as a cup into which waking and dreaming disappear. And when you wake up, they again emerge. Waking and dreaming emerge. So deep sleep is like a measuring cup in that sense. And mm, is also like that because if you look at it that way, oh uh and ooh, they disappear into mm because you close your mouth. Mm. And when you open your mouth, again ah uh and ooh come out. So like a measuring cup. Miti means measure. Mana here means miti or measure. And then um, the other similarity is laya. It's the point of dissolution. It merges back into deep sleep. Uh, waking and dreaming, if you look at deep sleep as cause, it all merges back into deep sleep um, here. And then again it emerges when you wake up. Similarly, all sounds, they merge back into mm. And then when you start speaking, they all seem to come out of it. So mm is the point of dissolution of all sounds. Here is a slight technical point I'll point out. It's, it's not important. If the question doesn't arise to you, then the answer is not important. But they thought of many things. See, the question of dissolution or merging back or whatever you call it, the understanding in philosophy, in, in Indian philosophy was, the cause is always the source of origin and also the place of dissolution. What does it mean? From clay it comes, the pot, into clay it goes. From gold it comes, the ornament, into gold it goes. From water it comes, the wave, into back into its water nature it goes. So things come out from their cause and go back to their cause. Coming out of cause is called creation. Going back into the cause is called dissolution. This is a very profound thing. This is why the Hindus always believed in the, not the creation and destruction of the universe, but the projection and resolution of the universe. Right? Manifestation of the universe. Think about it. When I said that the pot is a, not a new thing. The pot is a name and a form and a use given to an existing clay. So is it better to use the language of manifestation? Manifest and unmanifest rather than creating a thing. When you say creating, it means something new is being produced. So instead of saying a pot has been produced, a thing has been produced, the clay now manifests itself as pot. Same thing now manifests itself as a lump of clay. When it, the lump of clay manifests itself as a pot, you say a pot has been made. When it becomes a lump of clay again, you say it has gone back to its cause. Similarly, in Hinduism, in all the Indian philosophies, the cyclical idea of the universe, Ishwara exists with Maya. Again, we are not talking about Turiyam, we are only limited here. So, Ishwara exists with Maya, that is the unmanifest state of the universe. Then from that emerges the subtle and gross universes. It exists and back into Maya again. Just like you in deep sleep, you remain as consciousness with ajnana, ignorance. And then again from that emerges the waking you and the dream you and again merges back there. So everything emerges from its cause. Emerges means appears from its cause and then manifests and merges back again. 
That's why the Gita says, what is projection? All things come from the unmanifest to the manifest and they go from the manifest back to the unmanifest. It's not that something new is created. A potentiality is expressed and then again reabsorbed back again. Um, you have a question about this? Yes. yes. Three different aspects, yes. Mm. So, yeah, so that is a form from which other forms arise and they go back? Yes. Form means, the form word is not used, avastha, state. What state? Because this is, this is the causal state and these are the effects. That means um, the, the subtle state and the gross state and back again to the causal state. But in what kind of cause and effect? It is not something being produced and destroyed. Rather, it is something manifested and unmanifested. From abhyakta to vyakta, from vyakta to abhyakta. Abhyakta means expressed. Abhyakta means not expressed. But it's still there. Not expressed, but still there. Yes. But you know that example of rolling the dice? Yes. So the combinations can only come up. It just keeps on repeating. Yes. Does that fit into this? True. Ultimately... Would it be the same kind of expression? In the long run, yes. Um, there are only so many combinations that might come out. So, the cycle, each cycle need not be similar, but many things would be repeated and ultimately the same combination would come back again. Um, so, Vivekananda <laughs> says rather in a strange way, we have been here in, in this very Vedanta class in this very form, with these bodies and names and learning Vedanta so many times earlier. <laughs> but not the same, same uh, being. Uh, so different forms would come, but it's repeated again and again and again. It's, another example is like a Ferris wheel. It has gone through those, the same cars come and go in, the, in those forms, but the riders on the cars are different. So the same individuality attains to enlightenment and you are free. But it does not mean that there won't be other manifestations, other universes with other Manhattans and other Vedanta societies and other people coming. It, it will keep on happening. That's Maya. Is this what you wanted to ask? Yeah. There's a so book. There's an infinite aspect to that. Yes. There's an infinite cyclical aspect to that. It rotates in a loop. But again, Mandukya, you will say, not interested. What Mandukya says, what is the reality behind this? Is that the reality? Mandukya says, no, that's not the reality. Then what's the reality? This is a tremendous idea, a really grand idea. But it's also not the ultimate reality. The ultimate reality is Sturiyam, which is you. It's in you all this cycling is going on. And the cycling is not real in itself. It's not a real substance. The substance is you. That has to be realized. There's a book I read. The unbearable lightness of being? Yes. Uh, does he talk Milan about... Kundera. Milan Kundera? Does he talk about the continuous... Uh, yes. Yeah. Unbearable lightness of being. Uh, I think Nietzsche has picked up on this idea. Yeah. yeah. That this continuous cycle is possible. But if it's real, then it's horrifying. Uh, no exit. Then you are trapped in this. Uh, you're bound to repeat it again and again and again forever. <laughs> the good news from Advaita Vedanta is it's not real. It's entertainment. It's endless repetitions of the same sitcom. <laughs> TV serial. You're going to repeat it again. Reruns. Reruns again and again. Yeah, but, but it's you also. It, it's, it's your own, own r reality. It's a very grand vision of the universe. It's ultimate in recycling. Everything, nothing is wasted. It's all taken back and then put forth into new universes again. Um, so that's one similarity. Everything is, two similarities. One is deep sleep or mm. The similarity is that they function like measures into which waking and dreaming are poured and they come out again. Into which a uh and oo are poured and they come out again. Or they function as the point of dissolution. But no, the reason I brought up all this, there's a re the point. I was making a technical point. What was the point? I, that got lost. 
The technical point was, remember I mentioned that cause is the place where effects are dissolved. And it's the place where effects are created. Created means projected again, not really created. So clay is the point. So what would be the example? Clay is the place of dissolution of all clay parts. Water is the place of dissolution of all waves. waves. And the point of birth of all waves, water. It was born of water, it goes back to water. In the Bible you find ashes to ashes, to ashes dust, to dust to dust. We've actually come from dust. We means the body. The body will go back to dust. In, um, the, in Vedantic cosmology, the five elements. Pancha. The entire, not only this body, the entire universe, physical universe is made of five elements. That's why it's called prapancha. Prapancha means prakrishta in a pancha, which means the five in detail. Five in various combinations. The five elements in various combinations are everything in this physical universe. And where will it go when it's destroyed? Back to the five. One of the ways in Sanskrit which speaks about death, one way of expressing death in Sanskrit is Panchatvam gata, gone back to the five. Gone, when, when you want to be classical about it, uh, you're saying, instead of saying the guy is dead, he's gone back to the five. Gone back to the five means the body has gone back to the five elements. Instead of saying dust to dust, you'll say earth to earth, water to water, fire to fire, air to air, and sky to sky. So that's the expression of going back to. Anyway, the, the principle here is, from cause comes effect and into cause goes back effect. And so, so where is this leading? It's leading to a slight problem here. We said A oh, is the cause of everything. You say, you see, A oh, itself is modified into U and A and E. See, A, oh, you make the sound A oh, and then you transform it into, you may change the position of your lips, all other sounds emerge. A, oh, E, A, U, all of that. So that way, A should be the cause of everything, of all the letters, right? And so all sounds should merge back into A, not into M. Mm. Not making the problem? Uh -huh. It's a hitch, a bug in the whole system. It's a nice, nice system, but it's a small bug. Because somebody might ask, didn't you say one of your grand principles is everything emerges from cause and merges back into cause? So if... I understand everything emerges from Ishwara and merges back into Ishwara. But what about the letters themselves? There is a linguistic problem. Ah, so that's it, that is the answer. The answer is that it is true. Technically, all sounds are born of a. Uh, but practically speaking, the sound comes to an end when you close your lips. So, mm. So this is from a practical point of view, a spoken point of view, in that sense. That's the answer given. Ah, wait. Wait. That's what's going to come next. That's what's going to come next. That's next time. We have run out of time. So today we spent in talking. Next time we'll, we'll be all silent. The answer is no. Out of silence, nothing comes. All of these appear in silence and disappear into silence. If you say if it comes out of silence, then silence becomes the cause of all of them. Silence is not the cause. The kind of silence which this is, two kinds of silence are there. So how can there be two kinds of silence? Silence is silence. Don't you agree? If we have got so many people speaking so many languages in New York. A person speaks Chinese, a person speaks French or Spanish or Hindi. But when they all sit in silence, is there a Chinese silence and a Hindi silence and, and a French silence? No. The silence is exactly the same. But what I mean here is, there is a silence which is opposed to noise. And there is the silence which underlies both noise and absence of noise. This silence by that, it does not mean absence of noise. This silence actually means the pure consciousness in which all noise arises and subsides. That pure consciousness, in which all noise arises and subsides. So this is the meaning of the silence, not the absence of noise. I'll, I'll come to you. Because you see, when we are saying Turiyam, 
Turiyam is not only apart from all of this, but doesn't Turiyam underlie all of this? When you are in the waking, you are actually Turiyam. When you are dreaming, you are actually Turiyam. When you are in deep sleep, you are actually Turiyam. It is the one consciousness underlying all of them. Turiyam is available right now and all the time. Now if silence were the absence of noise, then silence would not be available when you are chanting Om. Silence would be available only when Om. No silence. Now, silence. But what they are trying to say is this silence is something that underlies this chanting of Om. And even when Om is not chanted, it's still there. Yes. Yeah. That is the silence. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, yes. What no. Are Shunyam is the void. Yes. All right. So just like the void pervades everything. Now, silence is the basis for. True. True. Sound. True. Silence is the basis for all sound and the absence of sound. Yes. Both the absence of sound and the absence uh, presence of sound. The source is silence. Source is not at the source of production, no. but that's the reality behind everything. Yes. The source of production would be uh, or mm, depending on your perspective. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now we are at a very dangerous point. We are asking whether Shunyam is the source of everything, the void. If Shunyam is the source of everything, then Turiyam is also Shunyam. Wait, wait. It seems I agree with you. It seems absolutely logical. Shunyam means the void. Is Turiyam the Shunyam? Because the way we Hindus have seen Turiyam, the ultimate reality, as Purnam, as the infinitude. But... Think about it this way. There are again two ways of understanding Shunyam. One way is, you see, absence of noise is silence. Absence of things is Shunyam. If you say that way, then Turiyam is not Shunyam. But the presence and absence of things, beyond all of that is the real void. That, if you say that's Turiyam, perfectly alright. In fact, this very thing which you are saying, this question is raised in Panchadashi. There is a debate going on between the non-dualist, between Vedanta and the Buddhist Shunyavadi, Madhyamaka. A debate is going on. And I'll tell you. Uh, it's, I think, in the second chapter itself. Uh, I'll, I'll just tell you. At that point, the debate comes to a point where the non-dualist says to the Buddhist, if you say that your Shunyam is beyond the manifestation and the unmanifestation of the things of the universe is something beyond that. Then we will say it's just another name for Purnam, for Turiyam. Our difference is only in name. What we call the full, you are calling the empty. How is it possible? Logically, it's perfectly possible. See, the Turiyam in itself, it's like saying the gold, for example. Is the gold an ornament? No. Gold in itself is not an ornament. If you say gold is an ornament, you say it could be. If it's an ornament, then all the time gold should be an ornament. You say, is gold a necklace? If I say. You say, yeah, it could be a necklace. Could be means, if gold and necklace are the same thing, then the gold always has to be a necklace. But that's not true. Gold can be a ring, it can be a brick of gold, it can be a lump of gold. So, Um, uh, In the same way, um, what was I saying? Yeah, Purnam and Shunyam. So the Purnam appears in all of these forms. But it's not a particular form in itself. Just as gold can appear as so many ornaments, but it's not an ornament. Can I say gold nature is empty of ornaments? Yes. It's not an... No, but can, uh, either way. Uh, uh, so, can I say that? No. No? Yes. You can say it. If you say gold nature is not empty of ornaments, the gold nature includes a necklace, then it always has to be a necklace. Not necessary. Hmm. The gold nature is independent of being an ornament. The gold nature, conti- it's like saying, does the rope nature include necessarily being a snake? 
Not at all. In fact, never. It can be mistaken for a snake. There is no real snake in a rope. Similarly, there is no real universe in, in Turiyam. So is Turiyam empty of the universe? Is Turiyam empty of the universe? In a very re- Not only can, in a very real sense, even when the universe is fully appearing, fully manifested as it is now, you can say Turiyam is empty, shunyam of the universe. Because there is no universe in Turiyam. There is no thing called a universe in Turiyam. Um, can I say that um, it's like saying holding a pot and saying the clay is empty of the pot. There is no pot. You see, yeah, in a particular sense there is no, no pot. Because as far as you take the substance, you are holding clay. In that sense, clay is empty of the pot. Though it appears as the pot and you can use it as a pot and you can call it a pot. Nama, Rupa, Vyavahara. Use, name and form. All are going on. And yet, really speaking, potential. yes, but no. it has potential. But that potential itself, is it a reality or the reality is the clay? The reality, the reality is the clay. Yeah. So, so, you can go on. Potential is all in, in Maya, in the use, in the game. Right? The screen on which you see movies, is, does the screen really have King Kong and Darth Vader and... Uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, all the, the biblical characters which you saw in the Ten Commandments, all of that, all of that, are, are they really part of the screen? Or is the screen empty of all characters? The screen is empty of all characters, but isn't the screen the potential for seeing and enjoying all sorts of films? Not only that, because it is empty, you can see any film in it whatsoever. Or you can see no film in it. If it really was Harry Potter came and took up the space in the, in the there would be no space left over for King Kong or somebody else King Kong takes a lot of space but because they really do not take up any space on the screen they don't exist they are projections on the screen the screen is the only reality the screen becomes the source of infinite projections of many many games you can play on it many many movies you can watch on it yet being empty of all movies and all characters and all stories It's his very empty nature which allows it to be a full nature. There infinity and emptiness meet. Shunyata and Purnata meet. Swami Saradananda, I'll end with this. Swami Saradananda, who wrote the authoritative biography of Sri Ramakrishna, in that biography, the great master, Sri Ramakrishna, the great master, he considers this and he resolves it in one line. He says, what they, the Buddhists, call Shunya, we, the Hindus, call Purna. Mm-hmm. What they call emptiness, we call infinity. It's exactly the same thing. And exactly the same definition is given. We'll see. Gaudapada will give the definition. What is Turiyam? He will say, is it something that exists? Think of it as, as gold and ornaments. So is gold, what is gold? Is it, an, is it a necklace? No. no. So is it, some, is it something, something? Is Turiyam a thing? Thing is like an, like an ornament. Uh, no. So is it nothing? No. no. When you say that the reality is not, uh, not the necklace, the gold, is, the gold is the reality and gold is not a necklace, then will you say that gold is nothing? How ridiculous. Gold is everything. The, in fact, compared to gold, necklace is nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So will you say that the thorium is nothing? No. no. Look what you said. Is the Turian something? No. Is it nothing? No. And then, is it a combination of something and nothing? No. Is it neither something, neither or nor nothing? No. These are the four alternatives Gaudapada will bring up. We'll see later on. And he will deny all of them. In uh, Sanskrit, Asti, no. Is it, the, is, it is th- something? No. It is not? No. It both is and is not? No. It neither is nor is not. No. These are four alternatives in Sanskrit called Koti. Chatush Koti Vinir Mukta Tattvam. The reality lies beyond the four logical alternatives. This is Gaudapada. Go back 700 years before Gaudapada to Nagarjuna who wrote the foundational text of Buddhist uh, emptiness. Mula Madhyamaka Karika. There he uses the word, he does not use Turiyam or anything like that. He uses the word Shunyam. Shunyam. 
And then he is asked, what is shunyam? Define it. What do you mean by shunyam? Is it something? He says, no. Is it nothing? No. Shunyam is mistaken often as nothing. Is it nothing then? No. Is it both something and nothing? No. Is, is it neither something nor nothing? No. Then what is it? Chatush koti vinir muktam tattvam. The principle which lies beyond the four logical alternatives. Exactly same definition given or same pointer given for emptiness and fullness. One, the peak of Buddhist philosophy, Nagarjuna. And you might say the peak of Hindu philosophy, Nadvaita and Shankaracharya's Guru's Guru. Both are defining their final conclusion in literally the same words. And you know the Shunyam, Nagarjuna starts, it's a Sanskrit text, Mula Madhyamaka Karika. He starts with an invocation. That was a style of writing. Usually they would bow down to the Buddha. He talks about the Shunyam, the ultimate reality, or ultimate, the void. And you know what he calls it? Shantam Shivam. Ah, Advaitam. Instead of saying Advaitam, he says Advayam. It is peaceful. Prapanchopashamam. The silence of the universe, peace itself. Shivam. He uses the word auspiciousness itself, non-dual. Exactly the same terms used, not by, not by Gaudapada. Hundreds of years before Nagarjuna, by the Mandukya Upanishad. Seventh mantra, Shantam, Shivam, Chaturtam, Shivam, Advaitam. Same words. Maharaj, huh? the screen example. Yes. Yes. Nothingness is inherent in it is conceivable. Yes. By that same line of thought, how do we say that infinitude is inherent in it? As I said, is, she's asking how do we know that infinitude is in it, inherent uh, if you use the screen example. Isn't the screen the basis of all movies? Infinite movies? All the things that you see in the movies, all the characters and events, what is the reality of them? The screen. It is the potential of seeing everything in the universe because of its empty nature. So it's like an empty canvas that allows you to paint on it. Empty canvas that allows you to paint and not allows you to paint. Maybe Maya can play everything on that because that's the empty reality. It gives reality to everything. So the, what is the screen here? Sat, pure being. Chit, pure consciousness. It has to be not any particular thing for it to be the basis of all particular things. Empty means what? Empty of particularities. So does emptiness have to come before infinitude? No. Infinitude and emptiness are the same thing. That's why this approach is more fundamental logically. If you say which comes first, existence or emptiness? Existence has to precede everything. If it is emptiness preceding existence, it will be a non non existent emptiness. Logically speaking, being comes before everything. Then only you can characterize it as non-specific being or specific being. Non-specificity is emptiness. Yeah. Otherwise, if it's not empty, if you say, no, it has to be, the ultimate reality has to be Vishnu. And then a particular name, particular form, particular mythology, then it excludes every other name, form and mythology. But if it is beyond any particular, it is beyond any kind of uh, specificity, then all specificities, specificities and particularities can be predicated of it. You can write and like this board, I can, I can uh, wipe it out and write something else. But all of it ultimately the reality is the board itself behind it. Uh, and the understanding of, yeah, and the understanding of Vedanta, the crucial message of Vedanta is this non-specific fullness which is existence, which is consciousness, which is the locus of all value, it's you. It's your real nature. That's what you are. This is the grand view of human nature that Mandukya has. Okay, we'll end with that question. Is potential an illusion? Is potential? Is potential an illusion? It's a good question. The way Advaita would say it, both potential and actuality. Potential, this is potential. And I won't say actuality, uh, potential and manifestation. Both of them are illusions in comparison with the Turiyam. Yes. Illusions means, be careful about illusions. They are illusions like movies are illusions in comparison with the, uh, with the screen. 
in comparison with thorium, they are illusions. But when you are in the illusion itself, it does not seem very illusory at all. You, if you are playing a part in the movie, so uh, then, then you have to follow the plot. Yeah. All right. Let's end now. Hmm. We won't do the meditation today. We run out of time. We had a full class today. Tomorrow, not tomorrow, next class. Yeah, just wait for a minute. In the next class, we will um, go to the 12th mantra, where it talks about the silence aspect. And that's the end of the Upanishad. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu Remember one thing, this side of the board and that side of the board, this side is secondary, it's a support, it's a help, helpful device. This is what the Upanishad really wants to say. <laughs>